Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, part of Agilent's Virtual Energy and Chemical Summit. I am Abby Powell of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. I now present today's speakers, Jenny Nelson, Paul Kamitz, and Yan Chung, Atomic Spectroscopy Applications in the Petroleum Industry. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. We will now, pre we will now begin the presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Petrochemical Summit. Thank you for virtually joining us. Uh, Jan and I are going to give you a tour of the Wooddale Center of Excellence, in which we're filming right now. Uh, my name is Paul Krampitz. I'm an application scientist for ICP, and I'll be giving you a tour of the ICP lab. Hello, everyone. My name is Jan Chung. I'm also an application scientist for ICPMS. And during Jenny's presentation, Paul and I is going to take you in each of our labs and show you how awesome our labs are. Are you ready, Paul? I am ready. Let's take them on a tour. Sure. Let's go. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jan. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny, and I'll be joining you remotely from my office in Berkeley, California. While Jan and Paul are setting up their laboratories to take you inside, I'm going to share with you some slides on the atomic spectroscopy applications in the petroleum industry. Today we're, we're going to be covering applications with the MPAES, the ICP OAS, the ICPMS, and the ICP MSMS. So most of you probably already know all the samples that arrive in the petroleum elemental analysis lab, so this could be review for some of you, and if not, maybe you'll learn something. So the first thing we get is crude oil. We normally get a lot of crude oil in the petroleum elementus, elemental lab. This crude oil can also be turned into various other products. After crude oil enters the refinery via the crude distillation unit or the vacuum distillation unit, it is separated into different intermediates based on its boiling point. Those intermediates can then be taken through various different parts of the refinery and final products are made. Final products range between refinery fuel gas, propane, natural gas liquids, gasolines, jet fuels, petrochemicals, kerosenes, diesels, you name it, there's lots of things that can be analyzed in the petroleum lab. Other things not on this list but can also be seen in the elemental lab are lube oils, additives, deposits, catalysts, raw materials, and lots of other unknowns. So with all these samples and all the various instruments and options, how do you know what to choose? Well, luckily at Agilent, we have various instruments that Paul and Jan will show you in their laboratories to help you analyze all those different samples. We have the MPAES, the ICP OES, ICP MS, the single quad, and also our triple quad, ICP MS MS. So a lot of those samples you can analyze on various different instruments. It's just going to depend on the requirements that you're looking for to which instrument you choose. Let's talk about some applications we've done using our microwave plasma atomic emission spectroscopy unit, or MPAES. A few years ago, we published this paper in Energy and Fuels, where we were looking at the elemental analysis of crude oils using the MPAES. We then published an application note on this work. After we did the crude oils, we decided to run some even harder samples, and these were the really heavy fractions, so 
things that were over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit and higher in boiling point, and we ran those on the MPAES. Again, we published that in an Agilent application note. Since those two papers, we've gone ahead and we've worked with ASTM and we finally have a final method titled Determination of Elements in Residual Fuels and Crude Oils by Microwave Plasma Atomic Emission Spectroscopy. This is D8322. We have done another video that is on this platform that's dedicated the entire time just talking about this method. So if you'd like to know more about this new ASTM method, be sure to check that out. Another thing that we've been working on with ASTM is a method for the biofuels by MPAES. This is work item 56916. And this is a new test method for determination of metals and biodiesels in organic mode by MPAES. Now we're gonna to go to Paul in the lab and he's gonna show you his MPAES. Well, hello, and welcome to the Petrochemical Summit here at Agilent. You were at the Wooddale Center of Excellence, and right now you're in the MP, Microwave Plasma, and AA. We have a flame over here on the left and a graphite furnace over on the left that's out of your screen, but we'll be focusing today on the MP. We'll give you a tour of the MP as far as it relates to the petrochemical industry, and then we'll switch over to ICP and ICPMS. So thank you again for attending the virtual summit. And as you can see right now, this is the MP. I'm gonna go ahead and switch um, over to another view for you so that you can see the, a little bit better view of the instrument itself right here. Uh, I'll give you a view a little bit later that will show you a close up of the plasma. Um, but this is your MP unit. Uh, this is your actual torch for your MP. Uh, you can you notice that it looks like an ICP torch, but it's but it's a lot smaller. It's a lower temperature plasma um, with detection limits that are in between AA and ICP. Um, for wear metals and oils, however, it's perfect. It has just the right amount of detection limits. Um, it can run a wear metal analysis depending upon how many elements you're doing in a couple of minutes. Um, it's linear dynamic range, so going low concentrations to high con concentrations are much greater than NAA. So I think for those of you that are familiar with AA, you're used to diluting 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 times. Uh, here it's a little bit more similar to an ICP as far as linear range. We can get up into the hundreds of ppm and then down into the ppb range for detection limits. Um, it's a nitrogen-based plasma rather than an argon-based plasma, so it is going to be a little bit cooler. So you do sacrifice some detection limits on the higher IP potential elements like arsenic and selenium, but typically for wear metals and oils, you're not, you're not looking for very low levels of those, and it works very, very well for that. Uh, so let me see if I can change to one more view here. And now you can get a close-up of the instrument itself. Um, you can see that the spray chamber right here, nebulizer, we're using a one nebulizer. This is perfect for oils. It's a high uh, total dissolved solid nebulizer. Um, and it handles wear metals uh, in oil. Um, extremely well. Your spray chamber is sitting right here. That's to separate the small from the large droplets. Uh, and you can see the reflection of the plasma here in the spray chamber. Uh, it has more of a, a red emission from the plasma rather than a bright white emission from, from argon. This is your, so this is your maintenance area here, or what we call the kitchen. Um, and it's very easy to take this apart, do any maintenance on, on the nebulizer, the spray chamber if you'd like. Um, I'll show you how to take the torch in and out um, quickly as well. It's very easy. It only goes in one way. And this is your sample tubing and your drain tubing. So that's a very quick overview of what the instrument itself looks like. And now I'm going to switch over here and share my screen. 
and we're going to show you a little bit about the software itself and what it looks like. Um, your, the timing of this virtual summit is actually um, perfect because I just happen to have a set of samples from a, a customer doing um, lubricating oils and gear oils uh, that are in the tray here, and that's the data that you're actually looking at the, at, at the screen. You're actually looking at a phosphorus peak uh, right now on the screen, and this is what we call a worksheet. So if I want to click from phos to sulfur to boron, um, you just click. This is a, a check standard that was uh, 20 ppm phos and sulfur. You see that we're getting very very good uh, recoveries on those checks. Um, the method itself is very simple. You basically choose the elements you want to run, um, tell the instrument uh, what configurations you want, whether you're using an auto sampler or not. Uh, then uh, you also tell it what conditions you want to run under. And they're all pretty standard conditions, so it's really easy to set up. Uh, thirdly, you go into the standards and you program your standards in. Go ahead and put in your samples, tell them where they are in the auto sampler. And then simply go to the analysis, choose the number of samples that you'd like to run, and simply hit the run button. Uh, and then it will go through and run your standardization, your checks, and all of your samples. And it's relatively simple to use. It's, it's uh, the learning curve on this instrument is, is very short. Um, I think it's as, as easy, maybe even a little bit easier than a flame AA. And it also does, um, it does these elements sequentially, but it does it all in one method, right? So you're not doing one element at a time. You're, you're running all those elements in one methodology, whether you're using lubricating gear, oil, gear oils or wear metals and all that. So um, I hope you enjoyed our quick little overview of, of the MP. And uh, now we're going to switch over and take you for a tour of the ICP lab. Thanks, Paul. Now, while Paul switches over to his inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy unit, or ICP OES, I'm going to share with you a couple applications that we've done at Agilent using our ICP OES system by direct dilution. You can see this first one was where we looked at multi-element analysis of used lubricant oils. Another example is where we did a high throughput multi-elemental analysis of crude oils. This was following ASTM D5708. Another example is the improved accuracy in the measurement of wear metals in additives in lubricant oils. And again, this was following ASTM D5185. And one more example for the ICP OES is the multi-elemental determination of gasoline using the ICP OES. If you're interested in any of those application notes, please reach out to us and we can share them with you. Now over to Paul in the lab to look at the ICP OES system. Hello everyone. Once again, I'm Paul Krampitz, application scientist here in the uh, Wooddale COE Center of Excellence. And you are now on a virtual tour uh, on our second stop, I think, and this is the ICP lab. Uh, so what you're looking at right here, and your timing for the virtual meeting here is absolutely perfect because I'm right in the process of running a lot of oil samples for an application study we're doing, wear metals and oils, uh, and then all kinds of different engines, engine oils, um, transmission oils, uh, swing gearboxes, all kinds of different things uh, on engines that are used to um, uh, build and disassemble uh, railroads. So kind of a really nice cross-section of oils that we're running here. This is the 5800 that you see right here. Um, this right here is actually the spectrometer box. It's in the new 5800. Uh, back in the day, this used to be three meters long uh, with detection limits and resolution that's not even close to uh, what this new design does for you. 
uh, it's new optics, basically. We, we're using some freeform optics, and it just gives you much better resolution and two to three times at least uh, better detection limits. Now, uh, for most wear metal and oil applications, you're not pushing the low PPB levels, uh, but the resolution is, is a bit of a big deal because you have a very structured background on, on oils. And what we're also seeing here, which is kind of neat, is um, you're seeing the valve right here. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here, see if I can make this work. Okay, so this is a little bit better look of, of what we're actually doing here. You can see here's a spray chamber, here's a nebulizer. This right here is the valve. And I took this, I uncoiled this loop right here so that you could see it a little bit better. This right here is a half mil loop. So we're filling up this loop with the sample. And then we're using this carrier after the valve switches to push what's in this loop up into the spray chamber. Um, I am actually doing what's called a screening right now of all these oils that you see over here. And let me see if I can get fancy here and zoom in a little bit more. So this auto sampler right here is a SeaTac 7400 um, auto sampler. And I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I think you can see it. So there's a drip tray down here. And there's also a stir assembly on the front. So this drip tray, you'll see it flip in when it's moving so you don't flick little droplets of oil all over the place or cross-contaminate your samples as it's coming across it. Um, and then you'll also see that when it comes in next here, like right there, this is stirring the sample ahead of the sample you're analyzing. So by the time you go to that sample, that sample's already stirred for you. Uh, so oil labs really do like this particular auto sampler. I'm definitely putting it through its paces right here. Uh, I did a quantitative run on, on a tray of samples here. I have a lot more, but this is one of the trays that I ran. And I'm running with a quarter mil loop, and I'm running at about 25 seconds a sample. Um, I also decided to do something a little bit different, um, and I'll show you on the software. But what, you're, what the instrument is actually doing right now, you can see how quickly it's running sample to sample to sample here. And what I'm doing is something that's part of what we call IntelliQuant. And no matter, so it's a simultaneous detector. Uh, we build a lot of smarts into it. So we can run this IntelliQuant program, no matter what's in your method, and it does pretty much the whole periodic table for you, plus or minus 20%. Um, I've tightened up the calibration a little bit because I updated the calibration to an oil calibration. So uh, the numbers are certainly 20% um, when you compare it to a quant. But here's a really cool thing that some of you might be very, very interested in. Um, if your lab is okay with plus or minus 10 or 15% because you're doing trend analysis, this entire periodic table screening that I'm doing right now is taking 17, 17 seconds of sample with a valve. Uh, and that's with a bigger loop even. I could probably shave a few seconds off of that. Uh, so that that may get some of your interest going uh, because it, it's a, an immense productivity tool um, uh, as well. So let me go back one more time here. And as you can see, this is draining the, the system out in the back of the auto sampler. There's a rinse vessel and then a drain vessel down here. So the rinse is constantly refilling the rinse vessel in the back corner here, right back there. And then the excess is being drained into an organic drain down on the bottom here that I'm not sure that you can see. It's right down here. Um, but this is, this is basically the setup for um, doing wear metals and oils, uh, biodiesels, uh, pretty much any organic uh, application. But again, this specifically is, is extremely good for, for oils. Now I'm going to scooch over here. And I don't know if you can see where this probe is, but it's almost done. There's 40, there's 40 samples on here. Um, and I started it a couple of minutes before I started this um, the video session here. 
and I've got about three more samples left. So we ran 40 samples in a, in a hurry here, especially at 17 seconds a sample. Um, so I'm also going to try, let's see if I can do this here. And I'm gonna try and share. My screen. So let's see if you can see this. Hopefully you can see this on your screen. These are samples. These are, like I talked about before, these particular samples are a wide variety of different samples. Um, and let me, let me zoom out here real quick. And uh, see if I can talk to you a little bit in my small box. There we go. So I'll just kind of talk to you while we're going through some of the software. I apologize, some of it's gonna be the back of my somewhat balding head. Um, but we're gonna go through some of the software here just so you can see. So this is an intelligent screening uh, method that we're running right now. And like I said, we're almost done with all 40 samples. Um, but if you click on a particular sample, like number one, I forget what number one was. Uh, number one, Number one was a Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. It was a Cummins engine, and the oil brand was a 15W40. So that, that's what that particular sample is that we're seeing here right now. And you can go through here and see that these numbers are the quantitative numbers um, as we go through. And the interesting thing is when I compare these numbers to a full quant, which is 25 second sample, um, the numbers are, you know, typically within 10% the way that I have it set up right now. Um, and you can, you can go through here and you can see that I have different types of oils. This one happens to have a lot of magnesium and calcium in it where the other ones didn't. And you can see that it's a heat map here, right? So red means you have a lot there, orange in the middle and yellow or light yellow means they're, they're lower concentrations usually at a PPM or lower. But you can also come in here and you can display these different samples as I click through them. You can display them and the worksheet's complete. So in a very short order, I just ran through and screened within about probably 10% um, all of those samples. Uh, this is amazing to me, by the way. Um, just surely from a productivity tool, but what this also is giving you is it's showing you surprises in your samples too. So you, you may not have thought that you had lead in your sample, or you may not have thought that you had, um, uh, Molly, well, Molly, I believe. Uh, but anyway, there could be some surprises in here that you're not, um, that you're not used to seeing. Supplier may come back and say, hey, you know, did you check for, um, um, I don't know, scandium or something. Uh, and you do have a record of that because you did a screen of the whole periodic table. Uh, you can do it in the bar graph. But what's really cool about this is I can go to the details and for the samples I ran, whoops, for the samples I ran, this program has all these smarts built into it, meaning it has all the wavelength tables in, in uh, from a variety, Bowman, MIT, Bowler, I forget the other tables that are in here, but even if you're not a spectroscopist, this box sort of is. Um, so depending upon the sample you give it, it knows what's in the sample because it's running everything. And since it knows what's in the sample, it's gonna go down here and say, well, don't use these, this boron doublet um, because this boron doublet, as you can see, says it has a very strong iron interference on it, which is true. So it's gonna tell you, hey, if you're running oils, use a 208 doublet. Um, instead, it's free from interferences. Uh, it also knows how much is in your sample too. And that's what we get from the periodic table, meaning just from this, you know, how, how much I have to dilute my sample. Do I have to do extra solutions? Um, I also know what standards do I need to make for quant? I know where everything is now as far as concentration, so I can make up, I can make up my standards as well. 
So very quickly, and I mean quickly, 17 seconds, um, it does not take much time to, to screen a set like this, and you can save yourself an awful lot of time because you can catch flyers, you can include elements maybe that you wanted to quantitate that weren't in the standard by making a standard because you know it's there. Uh, all kinds of different flexibility tools to increase your productivity in the lab for running oils. And I'll just click through a couple more here, see if there's any, any big surprises. I haven't looked at this data yet, so you and I are looking at this thing at the same time. Now this oil is a little bit different um, than the other ones. I'm not sure which one that is. That's 18, 18, 11, 18. This one just looks a little bit different to me. And 11, 18 is, pardon me, 1118 is also railroad, but this is a front differential from a Kershaw machine, 4660 machine. So you can tell just by looking at it that it doesn't look like anything that I've seen in the wear metals. Um, so anyway, it's a fantastic tool. Um, it's a tool to make your method development a lot easier. And as you can see, it's also an incredibly good quantitative, semi-quantitative tool for running oils very quickly. Uh, at the worst, you're 25 seconds a sample. If this kind of accuracy is good enough, then you're down to 17 seconds a sample. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, so I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty close <laughs> to my allotted time. And with that, I'd like to thank you for Coming on a tour, I know you've already done a tour in the MPA lab. Now you've done a tour in the ICP lab, so thank you for joining. And then next up, we're going to take you into our ICPMS uh, lab where Jan will take you on a tour of it, of our ICPMS units as far as uh, petroleum is concerned and wear metals are concerned. So thank you. Thank you once again for your attention. Thanks, Paul. Now we are going to be switching gears and talking about the ICPMS. So this is one of the instruments that is in Jan's lab, lab, and you'll see that very shortly. First, I'm going to share with you three application notes where we used Agilent's ICPMS systems, running them by direct dilution to measure different petroleum samples. This first one, we looked at multi-element analysis of crude oils using ICPMS. The next one that I'm going to show you, we looked at gasolines again by direct elemental analysis using ICPMS. And then the third one I'm going to share with you is one that we looked at metallic impurities in hydrocarbon fuels. So this is where they looked at things such as gasoline and diesel. So there's three examples where we'd use direct dilution straight into the ICPMS, so running it in organic mode. So now Jan's going to take you into her lab and show you the ICP single quad instrument. Hi, welcome to the ICPMS lab in the Chicago area, one of our center of excellence. Now let me give you a mini quick lab tour. Over here we have a 8900 ICPMS triple quad instrument. Along with a SP S4 auto sampler with a computer and printer. They all fit on this very nice lab bench. And over here we have a 7900 ICPMS single quad instrument. Also with a SPS4 auto sampler, computer and printer, and they also fit on this very nice lab bench. Next to it, we have a 7800 ICPMS single quad instrument. 
along also with an SPS4 auto sampler, computer and printer, and also on the nice lab bench with wheels. Hi, so I hope you enjoyed the mini lab tour. Now let's get to the main topic of today's webinar is to introduce organic samples in an ICPMS. But before I get to that, first I wanted to show you all the things that and the conditions that you will need to get your instrument ready for the introduction of organic solvent. Now first, you will need a oxygen and argon mixed gas plumbing to your instrument. Here I'm showing the gas inlet of the oxygen and argon mix that it's 20% oxygen and 80% argon. This will plumb into the back of the instrument. Here I'm showing the optional gas inlet from the gas outlet to the instrument. Now in terms of sample introduction, it's very important to use these Viton tubings as the peristaltic pump tubing. So that's different from the aqueous analysis you have been doing. As you can see, these Viton tubings is compatible with organic solvents so that the tubings doesn't break down during the analysis. Now in terms of the torch, it's recommended to use a torch with a smaller injector diameter, inner diameter. So this one I'm showing is one millimeter inner diameter injector torch. That's the purpose is to minimize the organic solvent reaching the plasma to avoid solvent loading of the plasma. I'm holding up the torch as you can see the innermost quartz tube is the injector, and you can see it's a one millimeter, very small injector. That's opposed to the, organ uh, the aqueous analysis that typically is used the 2.5 millimeter uh, torch. Now moving on to the combs and lenses. For the organic sulfon introduction, it's recommended to use a sampling comb with the platinum tip, as well as the skimmer comb with the platinum tip. That is the reason is that the platinum tip will be able to withstand higher temperature for the organic plasma. If you use a platinum tip for the skimmer comb, we recommend to use a brass lens base. So here I'm showing a brass lens base. On top here, I'm showing a brand new X lens that you can purchase from the Agilent store. As you can see, the lens base is stainless steel. So if you are using the platinum tip for the skimmer comb with the, with the platinum tip, then you will need it to purchase a brass base separately and then replace that stainless steel base for the lens stack. Okay, now I think I have gotten my instrument ready for organic solvent. I have the 20% oxygen, 80% argon mixed gas plumped into the instrument. I have the torch with a smaller injector installed, a sampling comb, skimmer comb, both with the platinum tips, and the uh, X lens are have the brass base. And over here for sample introductions, I still use this double pass spray chamber, of which I use a separate set of sample introduction glassware difference from the aqueous analysis is just for a quicker and easier changeover. 
that goes the same with the nebulizer. It's uh, especially for organic, but it's the same type that I have always been using the micro mist for the aqueous. Now the difference is that I have the Viton tubing for the sample tube and I no longer need the T because internal standard, if you're doing internal standard in your lab, internal standard will be spiked in into the standard. And then I have the waste tubing from the spray chamber hooked up. Now let me take you over to look at some of the samples I'm working on today. I wanted to show some of the samples that I will be running in the single quad ICPMS today. So here you can see that I have some pretty waxy sample, some dark loop oil type of sample, another oil sample a little lighter. Um, this one is a little thicker. Um, I will guess these are the um, uh, oil fee. And this one it's quite a bit lighter and we have some gasoline and not the range sample. Over here, we have the really difficult, nasty ones that all the analysts dislike. And if you, they can be actually chipped out to be a really hard, kind of uh, tardy looking sample. Okay, I have my standard prepared. The sample diluted and as here you can see I use silene as my rinse this is the rinse tray now I have all the standards ready and then the sample that is prepped the one in the back there is the sample that I was showing you was very hard as 14 samples and it's all ready to go for my day of analysis my instrument is ready and the sample is prepped. Another thing I wanted to show is that this SPS4 auto sampler enclosure. I really like the design of this auto sampler has an enclosure as well as a ventilation port. Um, as you might know that some of the uh, petroleum samples as well as the solvents they use for the petroleum analysis has a really strong odor. So with this auto sample or enclosure that you can really keep the air of the lab clean. Hi. I hope my mini tutorial for the introduction of organic solvents in an ICPMS is helpful to you. Now I pass the ball back to you, Jenny. Thanks, Jan. Now what we'd like to talk to you about is some special applications. This application is speciation analysis. So this is where we connect a GC to the front of an ICPMS to do speciation analysis. In these pictures, you can see our setup. Right here on the left, oh. Right here on the left hand side, you can see that we have a GC. This is the 7890. And we have a transfer line going from inside of the GC oven all the way over into our ICPMS. And in this case, we used a 7900. Over here, you can see how that connection works and where the GC, tra uh, GC um, transfer line comes out of the GC and into the ICPMS. Here's another picture that shows the torch. This is a special torch that's used just for this transfer line and different from a regular torch that's used in your regular standard setup. So when we do this type of application, we um, are looking, uh, we, you can use it for a variety of different app applications. One that I've worked a lot on is determine, determining volatile nickel and vanadium species in crude oil and crude oil fractions. Another application that one of my colleagues, Emmett and Steve, have worked on is the quantitation and characterization of sulfur in low sulfur reformulated gasolines. These are just two examples of where a GC can be used coupled to ICPMS to do some more interesting applications.
we're going to talk about the ICP MSMS or ICP triple quad. These are for those extra difficult applications. One of those applications is the determination of phosphorus, silica, and sulfur in acid digested lubricating oils using the triple quad. Another example is looking at chlorine. This is an application note and a paper that we published recently where we looked at chlorine in crude oils by direct dilution. Most people know that chlorine suffers a lot of polyatomic interferences, and so using the triple quad really helped us to work at the chemistry and get rid of those polyatomic interferences. Another special application that we did was we used the triple quad to look at some asphaltene solutions by single particle ICPMS. You can see we published this in Energy and Fuels and an Agilent application note. So now I send it back to Jan so she can show you the ICP triple quad in her lab. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the ICPMS lab. Sitting behind me is the Agilent 8900 triple quad ICPMS. As Jenny mentioned in her presentation, the triple quad ICPMS is particularly useful for those difficult applications. Analyzed like phosphorus, silicon, sulfur, and chlorine. However, in terms of organic solvent introduction into the instrument, all the requirements are very similar to the single quad ICPMS that I showed you earlier. Now let's take a closer look at the instrument. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, the requirement to introduce organic solvents in the instrument will be very similar to the single quad ICPMS that I showed you earlier. You will still need 20% oxygen and 80% argon mixed gas plumbed into the instrument. In terms of sample introduction, you also would need the Viton tubing for the sample tube in the peristaltic pump. Okay, with the torch that um, is also, we will recommend to use a torch with a smaller injector, the inner diameter, so it's one millimeter inner diameter amateur injector torch that is to limit the amount of organic solvents to reach the plasma to avoid solvent loading of the plasma. For the combs, for sampling comb and skimmer comb, both we recommend to use platinum tips combs that is to withstand the higher temperature of the organic plasma. In terms of the lens, we will recommend to use the brass base, lens base for the um, extraction lens. Now let's take a look on the inside of the 8900 ICPMS triple quad. By looking at the instrument, first you might notice it's a little longer than the single quad ICPMS. That is because an extra quadrupole is being fitted in front of the collision reaction cell. In a single quad ICPMS, after the extraction lens, there comes the collision reaction cell after that will be the mass selector quadruple, then is the detector. I actually don't have a spare quadruple to show you, so a nice cardboard box um, will serve the purpose of demonstration. But for a triple quad instrument, an extra quadruple is placed in front of the collision reaction cell. The extra quadrupole in front of the collision reaction cell is used to control the chemistry and the reactions inside the reaction cell. 
therefore more effectively to remove interferences. Okay, I'm still in the lab. As you can see, the 8900 is behind me. But I'm switching over here to PowerPoint slides because I wanted to show you a little bit more in detail how the triple quad ICPMS removing interferences with the triple quadruple. Okay, however, over here in this slide, I'm showing a cropped out of uh, the Mass Hunter software. Over here, you can see the control on the top here. And at the bottom here, these are the masks that I specially set up just for the demo purposes. As you can see, I selected all these uh, difficult elements that we were talking about, silicon, chlorine, phosphorus, and sulfur. So first, um, let's take a look at uh, silicon. Here we are looking at mass 28. But as you can see, that there are uh, polyatomic interferences, nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen, they are all very abundant in the, in the plasma. So they will create a massive interference for silicon 28 if you would want to measure on mass 28. So we are using the hydrogen gas mode here in you and doing on mass detection. So essentially what we are doing here is that we are using hydrogen to remove away all the interferences. So at mass 28, we are able to see silicon ion very nicely in low level. Okay, so let's take a look at here. So here in the software, it tells you we are using hydrogen mode. We're using the MSMS triple quad. We are doing on mass, so we are detecting 28 in the Q1 quadruple one, and then also uh, Q2 is also 28. Okay, moving on to the next mass, next analyte we want to look at is chlorine. Here we, we are looking at chlorine mass 35. Chlorine is uh, really hard to 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 detect in low level, it's because it's a very common contaminant uh, because we're using hydrochloric acid and uh, uh, chloride is everywhere. And it's also really hard to detect in low level, that's because its first ionization potential is very, is relatively high. And on top of that, there are also polyatomic interferences for at a chloride mass 35. So here we're also using the hydrogen reaction gas mode. We're shifting the mass 35 to mass 37. Then um, we are shifting the mass here by reacting that with um, hydrogen. It's a sequential reaction with two step reactions and we essentially, we're adding two hydrogens onto the chloride 35 to make mass 37. OK, phosphorus. So here we are looking at mass 31 for phosphorus. A lot of uh, polyatomic interferences are all from elements that are very common and in large amount in the plasma. Here we are using oxygen gas mode. We are shifting mass 31 to 47. So we are adding one oxygen to the phosphorus 31 to make the mass 47. And all the other interferences will have no reactions with oxygen. One important thing to point out here is that titanium also have a mass at 47. But with the Q1, we're only allowing mass 35, 31 to enter the reaction cell. So titanium 47 would not even enter the reaction cell. So what comes out of the cell when it, then we set the Q2 at 47, we are only selecting the phosphorus with one extra oxygen. So we can detect 
phosphorus in very low level as well. Lastly is sulfur 32. Um, very commonly 32, two oxygen makes up 32. That's a really uh, a large polyatomic interferences for sulfur if you would like to measure in 32. Once again, we are using an oxygen reaction mode. We're shifting sulfur of 32 to 48 by adding one oxygen at mass 16. And then the interference of oxygen dimer would not react with oxygen so that um, we successfully shift the mass to a new mass 48. Once again, titanium have mass 48 and it also have really high abundance as well. But we are setting mass 1 at 32, so titanium would not even be allowed to enter the reaction cell. So what exit the cell at Q2, it's only selecting mass 48 that are the result ions from the reaction of sulfur and oxygen. Okay, I hope you enjoy my quick overview of the triple quad ICPMS instrument. If you want to find out more information, please feel free to reach out. Okay, Jenny, now back to you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Paul. We are happy to answer any questions. Um, please feel free to ask. Also, if you don't want to ask any questions in this format, please feel free to email us at our email addresses on this screen. Thanks again. And I just want to say thank you all for that very engaging, informative presentation. Um, we uh, thank you again for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to uh, thank the audience for joining us today. And again, like Jenny said, questions submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through November of 2021. And until next time, thank you and have a wonderful day.